Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kaushal Kishore. I'm a chartered accountant. And for the next one hour, I'll be presenting uh, an overview on the company's bill. Uh, thank you for participating uh, here on this uh, on this webinar. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of uh, what the company's bill is, uh, let, let me give you a brief background where it started and uh, where we are at the present. As of now, uh, while there have been a couple of milestones, uh, if you look at the the bill in its present form, it was uh, introduced in 2009. A uh, lot of uh, changes happened in the ministry. Uh, we we saw a couple of uh, ministry of corporate a couple of changes in the ministry of corporate affairs as well. Uh, starting from uh, at that point in time, I'm talking about Mr. Salman Khushid to Sachin Pilot now. Uh, so after these various milestones and consultations during the years 2009 to 2011 uh, and after significant amendments by the parliament, uh, parliamentary committee, it was reintroduced as a fresh bill in December 2011 and precisely in December 2011, 14th of December, and then finally it was referred to the Standing Committee on Finance in January 2012. The Standing Committee gave its report in June 2012 and uh, it was presented to the Lok Sabha in December 2012. Uh, it was passed by by the Lok Sabha, uh, but but it gets stuck at the moment uh, with Rajya Sabha, and I'm sure with the monsoon session starting now, uh, this will be presented there. It's likely that it is uh, passed in the Rajya Sabha in the monsoon session. So that is that was the uh, background by which we were uh, uh, we were talking about the company's bill. Uh, if you look at the company's bill and the, its structure, uh, there are 29 chapters, there are 470 clauses and 6, 7 schedules. There are several items to be prescribed and uh, just, to, just to count these numbers, out of 470 clauses, there are 370 clauses which require rules to be prescribed, which uh, I would believe uh, the bill in its present sense of 470 clauses is not a small one. As we normally compare with the existing Companies Act, which has 13 parts, with uh, 26 chapters, 700 plus sections and uh, 15 schedules. While there are several random sections, but still I would say 700 sections compared to 470 clauses uh, plus the rules to be prescribed in respect of 370 clauses. I think the current bill in its present form is pretty large opposed to the normal understanding that the bill has been concised or it has been reduced to 470 clauses. Uh, if I try and summarize this uh, uh, bill, there are seven uh, broad important attributes uh, and, and just going one by one, we had a very sharp reaction to the corporate uh, environment. Uh, the scams uh, led to skepticism and the skepticism uh, led to regulations and regulations are in the present form of better corporate governance in, 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 in the form of several laws and the regulations within the companies will uh, to talk about uh, uh, various regulations on corporate governance, various things uh, in, in terms of directors, in terms of independent directors, auditors, and uh, all of them. Uh, the consequential item was to enhance accountability. And there is an enhanced accountability for everyone, whether it's the board of directors, the independent, uh, independent directors, the auditors, the, uh, the chief financial officer, and everyone who's managing funds for others. Uh, I think there are several provisions in the company's bill uh, to enhance accountability, uh, to put onus on people, uh, to put penal provision provisions as well. There are significant penal provisions in the bill. To talk about uh, how do we synchronize the size and the regulation, uh, uh, if you look at the numbers, there are around uh, 13 lakh companies uh, in India registered with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs or with the ROC. There are around 12 lakh companies out of these 13, uh, which are private companies. So uh, if you look at the Companies Act presently, there are a significant number of uh, sections which are applicable to both, whether they're private companies or public companies. There are, uh, there are very small number of uh, provisions which would be uh, only relevant for public companies and not relevant to private companies. But if we look at the bill, I think this is a, uh, this is a pretty good move that uh, the, according to the size and the constitution of the companies, the regulation is intended to be applicable uh, uh, accordingly there. So if you look at 1% company, there would be provisions relating to them. 
there would be private companies which have uh, two different sections, whether small companies and other public private companies. Uh, public companies are divided into listed and other companies, there are dormant companies. Uh, limited liability partnerships, etc., which have been recognized in this. So there is a significant amount of uh, synchronization between the size of an organization and the regulation applicable to it. The next item which we want to talk about as a as a broad uh, element of the company's bill is social cause and empowerment. Uh, an offshoot was uh, in, in terms of changing the company's bill. Uh, this was to assess the infrastructure and. Uh, uh, possibility of taking help to improve the infrastructure, social conditions. So that has come out with several provisions in terms of uh, uh, CSR, in terms of uh, women empowerment, and etc. The global trends in financial reporting was one of the items which was pending. We couldn't cross the IFRS milestone in 2011, and in 2012, MCA uh, revised the format of the financial statement, which was. Uh, which was more towards IFRS. So, so at the moment, whatever financial statements we see, uh, it's it's a flavor of IFRS may not be full IFRS. But uh, and and there are several discussions and views uh, which are happening uh, regarding implementation of IFRS in India in near future. It may happen in 2015 or 16. Uh, there is no uh, there is no fixed timeline at the moment to talk about when IFRS would be uh, applicable. Uh, but but the bill mandates uh, uh, consolidated financial statement, which is a good move and which is more towards uh, international reporting. Uh, if you look at several procedures and uh, regulatory intervention as per the Companies Act, uh, uh, th there are several items where one needs to go to the central government and Ministry of Corporate Affairs to uh, to get the approvals done. The bill has tried to simplify several procedures. Uh, MCA shifts the uh, the approval process uh, to the relevant stakeholders instead of going to the central government. So I think there, there would be a good move and it's a welcome move I would say uh, that uh, it, it's not through the bureaucracy, it's it's more towards the stakeholders taking decisions and uh, that, that I believe is a good decision. Uh, one of the points was how to deal with the redundancy. For example, in the companies like there are several provisions uh, which talk about uh, uh, treasurers, secretaries, managing agents, etc. No more applicable to the companies as of now, and they have all been uh, done away with. So, as I said, that there are 470 clauses plus uh, several provisions uh, which are yet to be recommended in terms of uh, uh, regulation or the rules to be prescribed. Uh, 370 of uh, them, largely. Uh, so, so it sounds like a large, large bill or large regulation. Moving on to the next item, next slide. The, the objective of this webcast is uh, to summarize only the salient features of selected chapters because there are 29 chapters, uh, not possible to cover them in one hour, or one and a half or two hours. So uh, what what I decided that uh, we, we talk about certain uh, specific elements and certain important items. But the focus is on the awareness only, it's not conclusive views and, uh, and there are possible interpretations because it's a bill. Uh, sometimes it, there, there is a feeling that the drafting uh, may not be uh, very appropriate and therefore therefore there are a lot of things which are subject to interpretations and which may require detailed analysis and consultation. So with that note, I think I'll be covering uh, some of these items like accounts of the companies uh, and, and in different parts, in uh, uh, three parts largely. So the first of the part we'll cover uh, accounts and audits related uh, payments and declaration of dividends. The second part would be largely uh, on the board of directors, on the remuneration, etc., on the constitution of uh, the, the board, the so audit committee, etc. Uh, I, I think part two is more relevant from the uh, from the corporate governance point of view, and which is more relevant uh, in the in the context in which the bill has been drafted uh, afresh. The third part is more towards uh, several other provisions which relate to government companies. Uh, some of the important items are relating to compromises, arrangements, and amalgamations. Uh, and some of the new concepts, so for example, registered value is one of them. So, uh, in in a short span of time, in uh, almost uh, 45 next 45 minutes, I'll try and cover uh, all these items uh, one by one. Once uh, once I'm through with the presentation, we'll open the floor for uh, for discussions and and for your questions, and we'll try and answer whatever possible. Or we may like to have your questions noted down so that we can uh, respond to you at a later time. So uh, let, let, let's talk about the first part, which is more on the accounts of the companies, uh, and there are significant changes uh, in, in 
this particular section. So the, uh, if we talk about the financial statements, the bill makes it mandatory to prepare consolidated financial statements and this is applicable to all the companies as per the bill uh, where, where you have subsidiaries or joint ventures or associates exits. So which is very different concept uh, compared to what the present concept is. Uh, presently only the listed organizations in India, uh, they prepare consolidated financial statements only in a situation where they have subsidiaries and if they don't have any subsidies, in spite of the fact they may have joint ventures or associates, uh, they do not prepare consolidated financial statement which is not required as per the accounting standards. However, the bill is a little different, it says it's either subsidies or joint ventures or associates. If they exist, prepare consolidated financial statements for all the companies against the uh, listed organizations only. And uh, these, uh, uh, the consolidated financial statements would be in addition to standalone financials that necessarily, uh, that are necessarily required for publication. Uh, there is a schedule three which proposes additional mandatory disclosures in consolidated financial statements. So which is a form of financial statements largely on the lines of what we uh, see presently in the Companies Act uh, which, is, which is existing. And the central government may also prescribe certain rules to prepare the consolidated financial statement. I don't know what addition they will make so far as these rules are concerned because we already have a standard, accounting standard uh, uh, prescribed by the, the Institute of Chartered Accountants and by MCA uh, by which consolidated financial statements are prepared. Uh, so uh, largely this was on the financial statement if we uh, move to the next slide. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the very important items and very controversial uh, uh, items in terms of corporate governance regulation. Uh, where uh, companies bill is talking about the revision in financial statements and the board's report. Uh, if you look at the reopening of the financial statement, the current provisions do not allow uh, reopening of the past financial statements for the purposes of uh, uh, presenting to the shareholders. Any corrections which happen, they may happen only subsequently and in the, in the following years. Uh, you're, not, you're not supposed to open the financial statement which have already been adopted by the uh, shareholders in the past uh, the annual general meetings. <coughs> but uh, so far as the bill is concerned, uh, the financial statements can be reopened of the past with regulatory intervention and which can be on application made by the, either the central government or the taxation authorities or the Securities or Exchange Board of India or any other regulatory authority for that matter if they uh, and they have to get an order from, from a court or tribunal uh, and if they believe that there is a fraudulent financial reporting or the affairs have been mismanaged casting it out on the financial statements, they can, they can ask for uh, a reopening of the financial statement or recasting of the financial statements of the past. Even the directors uh, may prepare revised financial statements or the board report uh, if they get an approval from the tribunal. And, uh, and this is uh, largely on the basis that uh, the clause 129 which is relating to accounting standards or clause 134 which is relating to board report. If the board of directors believe that they are not in compliance with, uh, with the accounting standards or, uh, or in, uh, in, in line with these particular clauses, uh, they, ca they can ask for uh, preparation of the financial statements of the past. But this can happen only once in a year but for three preceding financial years. So, so I think the frequency is pretty, uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a large frequency. Because you can prepare, prepare every year for past three for preceding financial years. So, so I think this is a this is a very new move. Uh, uh, so far as the concept is concerned, which presently is not there uh, in the accounting standards. Uh, another authority in terms of accounting and regulation is the National Financial Reporting Authority. Uh, presently, we have uh, NACAS, which is uh, National Advisory Committee on the Accounting Standards uh, within the uh, parameters of the Companies Act. Uh, it's not only recommendations on accounting, uh, but they can provide recommendations on the auditing standards, which is something very new and which means that the powers from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India are being shifted uh, towards the Ministry of Corporate Affairs or to NFRA uh, per se. And they, they are supposed to monitor and enforce compliance with accounting and auditing standards uh, and they will see the, uh, the, the quality of the services of chartered accountants. Uh, they have actually got the quasi-judicial powers for oversight over the chartered accountants. Uh, they, they have powers to investigate into the professional or other misconduct of those uh, professionals. And if uh, this, is, this is a pretty harsh, if, if misconduct is proved, uh, they have the powers to debar a member or a firm for up to 10 years. Uh, 
Another thing, if NFRA is initiating any investigation, there is no other institute or body to continue any proceedings. So, so I think they have given very specific powers and very strong in terms of uh, the way the language has been uh, written. Moving on to uh, the next slide, if you look at the contents of the board report, uh, there, are, there are three things which are happening in terms of the governance, the compliance and the operational effectiveness uh, of the business. Uh, so, uh, the director's responsibility statement in the board report uh, will include, uh, in case of listed companies, an assurance on adequacy and effectiveness of internal financial controls. You know, I think it's a very onerous statement to say that uh, the, the, there is an assurance and adequacy and effectiveness of internal financial controls. We don't know what internal financial controls the, the scope would be because, uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's a much wider term uh, as compared to what we talk about as internal controls or anything. Uh, in the Western world, we, we talk about the internal controls over financial reporting process, but so far as this term is concerned, it's much wider. And in case of all the companies, uh, there is an assurance on adequacy and effectiveness of system to ensure that the applicable laws and regulations are all complied with. Uh, besides that, uh, we will talk about the CSR initiatives and the, there would be details of risk management policies uh, uh, in, the, in the board support. This also talks about, which is, which is something very new, though it is discussed in the boardroom, but uh, what it says is that in case of listed and any other public companies which may be prescribed, uh, the board will have to include a statement on uh, evaluation of annual performance of the board, its committees and individual directors. And I think it's an operational effectiveness which will be uh, commented by the board of directors in the director's responsibility statement. And I think this particular slide describes the, how onerous the responsibilities are on the board and uh, how they need to be uh, transparent in terms of the uh, public disclosures. Uh, we spoke about corporate social responsibility, talk of the town in terms of the corporates, uh, uh, talking about it very frequently now uh, because uh, this will range, uh, uh, this will result into a significant amount of cash outflows. Uh, if you have a net worth uh, of 500 crores of more or a turnover of 1,000 crores or more or a profit of 5 crores or more. So I think there, there would be a, a significant number of companies which will be covered by this particular clause because the profit of 5 crores is a very uh, small amount uh, during any financial year. And this clause says that uh, the, the company shall ensure to spend at least 2% of the average profits of the prior 3 years. The profit is to be computed based on a particular clause which is largely if I simplify it uh, as we normally calculate the managerial remuneration. It's the similar way uh, this profit is to be calculated. And if, uh, if, the company is, uh, if the company is not in a position to spend the total amount, uh, you have to disclose the reasons. Uh, there are penalties for non-compliance for disclosures. Uh, so you can argue that if there is an unspent amount, you, know, you don't need to carry it forward. But disclosures are more important. So I think uh, what regulatory requires is that while you have committed something in the, at the beginning of the year, you made entire plans and you were not successful and you failed in that and you'll be stating that in your, uh, uh, in your annual results that you are not in a position to complete this plan. Uh, the, there are significant uh, uh, items, so there are suggested CSR activities and they are to be preferably in the local areas and uh, there is a particular schedule which uh, writes down around nine activities and there is another additional item that said some other items should be prescribed. Uh, so it's not it's not an exhaustive list. You can you can spend a lot of money uh, on on different items, uh, for example, and they, they all cover hunger, poverty, education, gender equality, blah blah blah, including the prime minister's national relief fund. Uh, if you look at this concept, this comes out from uh, the public sector undertakings, which uh, which are already spending uh, money on CSR, which is already mandatory for them and they, they spend almost half a percent to five percent of their total profits uh, on, on CSR. Uh, there are significant amounts of disclosures as I said in the financial statements. Uh, in terms of the policies uh, and, and the formation of committee etc. in terms of uh, uh, the responsibilities of the board, uh, the board has to disclose the composition of CSR committee and they have to approve CSR policy in the report at the beginning of the year and they need to ensure CSR activities are undertaken by the company. So, so entire process in the monetary system uh, lies with the board of directors. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, uh, unfortunately, at the moment, this is not clear whether this this particular item would be tax deductible in the, uh, so far as taxation is concerned. 
Uh, another thing which uh, we gather from from our general understanding is that the monetary contributions are likely to be discouraged because the regulatory does not require a check contribution, but they require uh, actual participation in CSR activities and uh, and and actual projects to be monitored by the companies instead of just uh, you know cutting a check and delivering it to the regulatory. Another uh, interesting change is that the, the financial year would be uniform and uh, uh, all those years would be from uh, April 1 to 31st March. Uh, if you are incorporated on or after 1st of January, the period ending will be 31st March of the following year. So, uh, so the first year can be 15 months uh, or so and the next one was the 12 months as we normally follow for taxation purposes. So there would be a uniformity of financial year in all the cases and there can be a few exceptions in this regard. Uh, for example, if you are at a subsidiary company of a foreign company and they need to incorporate your financial results outside India. Uh, you are not supposed to, if you are not supposed to publish your financial results uh, to, to larger public, then you may be exempted from this particular uh, section. Otherwise, the uniformity of the financial year, um, that uh, needs to be maintained as per the bill. The existing uh, companies will have to align within within a period of two years from the commencement of the act. So, I think there is a, there is a good transition period to uh, change your financial year. There is uh, another significant change uh, which I can see is uh, the definition of subsidiary. Uh, if you look at the bill, uh, it talks about a subsidiary company means a company which exercises or controls more than one half of the total share capital. So I think uh, this is uh, this is taking into account the equity share capital or any other kind of capital you may have. Uh, and I would assume that even the preference capital would be included in this. Whereas if you look, look at the existing law, uh, the, the definition would say if you hold more than half in nominal value of its equity share capital this is very clear uh, in terms of the equity share capital compared to what the equity plus the preference capital which is proposed by the company's bill. So uh, maybe that in some of the cases and another interesting thing is that you can't have uh, layers of subsidiaries beyond such numbers as may be prescribed. So, so when you can have subsidiaries but there will be a number uh, which will be prescribed in terms of uh, uh, the, the subsidies down below and uh, I'm sure that there would be some clarity in terms of existing structures because there is a chain of holding and subsidy companies in a large number of corporate houses uh, which may need restructuring or may need some kind of uh, grandfathering of those structures uh, as per the law. So uh, this was the provisions, uh, these were the provisions relating to accounts, etc. I will briefly touch upon some of those provisions relating to auditors uh, and, and audit, etc. So uh, if you look at the present, present regime that requires retirement and reappointment of the auditors at each AGM, uh, whereas the bill proposes uh, there would be a five years of tenure instead of reappointment uh, at every AGM though it has to be ratified every year which uh, which I'm not sure what it means that ratification means that uh, if, uh, if ratification does not happen does it mean that the auditors are to be removed in that year. So I'm sure that there would be a manner and procedure which may be prescribed and that will clarify this position but but uh, the, the intention seems to be that there is a block appointment of five years uh, of a particular auditor. A very significant change which is happening in terms of rotation is uh, that for auditors of listed and other companies which may be prescribed, uh, the bill proposes a mandatory rotation. So for individual auditor, one term of five consecutive years, that is the that is the term which has been defined. And for audit firms, maximum two consecutive terms of five years. And there is a transition period of or pool of period of five years uh, in these cases. So th uh, this is really significant in terms of the concept and in terms of uh, 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 rotation. So worldwide, there are not many countries which have rotations. So very very recently there have been a rotation uh, principle in Netherlands. Uh, there were certain rotation principles I believe in uh, Italy and France uh, in terms of joint audits etc. also. Another uh, sharp reaction if you look at to corporate scams uh, is that a lot of powers have been given to the members of the company and they have the option to resolve uh, rotation of the audit partner and team at a specified interval uh, and even appointment of joint auditors so, uh, so uh, the, uh, the shareholders can exercise their discretion. And, and intervene in terms of appointment uh, of joint auditors as well as rotation of audit partners and the teams. Uh, the maximum number of companies which can be audited per partner are restricted to 20 uh, which is opposed to 
uh, uh, 30 at the moment and uh, companies that talks about 30 companies uh, including certain other parameters but there is uh, there is a bit of restriction I can see that uh, this is being reduced to 20. Uh, if you look at the responsibilities on the auditors, I think the scope has been significantly expanded and uh, the observations and comments on financial transactions or matters having adverse effect, uh, I'm not sure what is the scope of this particular item and what it means. Uh, and, and the, for example, there, there are several transactions uh, including let's say some interest fee loans have been given to a related party. Uh, they, they find a place uh, in, in Caro at the moment, they are not uh, quantified uh, in the main reports. But, but so far as this uh, clause is concerned, it looks like if there is any matter having adverse effect on the functioning of the company and it financially affects the company, then you need to put in the report uh, as auditors. Uh, there, there would be qualifications, reservations uh, or remarks relating to maintenance of accounts, now, which, are, which are presently also uh, they are being done in case there are negative comments. Uh, any, any, something additional which has happened is, uh, that the auditor has to report on the adequate internal financial control system which is much larger responsibility I would say. Uh, as I talked about the director's responsibility where uh, they also need to talk about internal financial controls. Here the auditor's responsibilities include commenting on the internal financial control system which is much wider than uh, internal controls over financial reporting as we've seen in the western world. Uh, it may be similar or it may be, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the Institute of Chartered Accountants would clarify these things. Uh, something very interesting would say that the auditor needs to report to the central government if a fraud is being or has been committed. Uh, I'm sure that there would be some guidelines to what kind of fraud, what is the materiality and at what point in time the auditor is supposed to talk to the central government on these items. So uh, personally uh, speaking, I, I look at a lot of guidance in this regard instead of uh, you know, creating a whole lot of transactions being reported without any uh, objectivity in this particular item. Uh, uh, another thing which is being prescribed is that uh, there are a whole lot of uh, services uh, by the auditors which will be prohibited for an audit client and all non-audit services uh, will be approved by the audit and the board comi bo uh, audit committee of the board of directors. So uh, presently there are certain rules and the parameters for uh, listed organizations but not for all. Uh, this is being extended to all the companies. So uh, these were a uh, few provisions relating to auditors and the audits. Uh, just moving on to uh, provisions relating to declaration payment of dividend. Uh, not many changes but there are two or three significant changes which I want to talk about. Uh, transfer of profits to reserves becomes discretionary which is mandatory as, as of now. So uh, when you declare a dividend you need to transfer a percentage to, uh, to reserves. Uh, even, even the adjustment of depreciation and loss of earlier years that, that is also required as per the Companies Act which, uh, which, which is not being made mandatory as per the bill. So that's a significant move if we, if we talk about the declaration of dividend. And uh, another uh, restriction which is being laid down is that in case of loss during the current year, uh, there is a limit on the dividend which you can declare. So, uh, so this, which, which, can, which will not exceed average of the past three years and uh, if there is a loss up to the previous quarter end, you have to restrict your dividend payments. Moving on to the next slide, uh, there, is, there is one change which I noticed in the Investor Education and Protection Fund. Uh, for example, presently if there are unpaid dividends or unpaid uh, amounts uh, due, to, uh, due to shareholders or uh, debenture holders or the fixed deposit holders, etc. Uh, uh, presently those amounts are transferred to the Investor Education and Protection Fund. Uh, what Bill says is that, uh, for example, if a, if a dividend has not been paid for seven years, even the corresponding shares are also to be transferred to Investor Education Protection Fund. I'm, I'm sure that MCA will have to clarify the uh, administrative aspects of how will this provision work. Uh, when the shares are also transferred, the subsequent uh, dividends also will have to move to Investor Education Protection Fund. How will it work in terms of uh, uh, NSDL or ISDL uh, kind of uh, agencies? Uh, so, so all those administrative provisions and I'm sure that they will clarify. Uh, so far as this provision is concerned. Uh, coming to uh, provisions relating to depreciation, there are some structural changes in depreciation. Uh, useful lives have been prescribed instead of rates. So presently schedule uh, 14 provides the, the, the rates, the minimum rates to be applied to the fixed assets. Uh, so, so far as companies bill is concerned, uh, they, this is providing useful lives instead of the rates. 
and there are two sections which talk about the class of companies to be prescribed where the useful life will be only uh, prescriptive and uh, in respect of other companies uh, these lives would be maximum prescribed useful life so there is a bit of uh, difference and I believe that the first provision would be applicable to those companies which will apply in AS at some point in time and other companies will apply uh, you know so far as uh, minimum rates are concerned. Uh, as per the company's bill there is a reduction in life in several cases I will show you on a slide in the next slide uh, where we will talk about it. Uh, so, so there are significant reductions in some of those cases uh, in terms of life. There is no specific life for intangibles and you have to follow the standard and you have to identify the life yourself. There is a component accounting which is specifically mandated I think presently also it works well but there are implementation uh, differences. Uh, so the, if there is a major uh, overhaul which is a non-physical component and if there is a major part or a component which is a physical component you need to identify if it is a separately uh, identifiable uh, significant component and we are not talking about small nuts and bolts uh, if it is a significant component and if it, is a, if it has a different life then you have to depreciate accordingly and some of these examples are for example in, uh, in a steel furnace you have linings you have uh, in airplanes you can have a different life for an engine uh, in uh, fertilizer plants you can have catalysts which have a very different life and which is very limited life so all these cases uh, they are significant components which can be identified and can be depreciated separately. So uh, uh, companies will mandate that uh, these, these are to be looked at separately. Uh, just to give you a, a flavor of uh, some of those uh, you know lives. Uh, so, so say the general plant and machinery life is being reduced from 21 years to 15 years. A continuous process plant there is a significant change from 19 years to 8 years. I am not sure whether this, this is right or wrong. Because there are significant uh, number of corporates uh, I dealt with and and they they talked about that this this is uh, it does not make sense uh, to have a life of eight years of a plant which may have a life of thirty years and twenty years. Uh, the furniture and fittings the general data has been reduced from sixteen years to ten years. Uh, similarly, for office equipment from fourteen years to five years, and and so on and so forth. So uh, there are significant changes in terms of uh, life of the the assets, and it may have a significant impact on the financial statement, the profit and loss count of the companies. Uh, and not to mention that uh, it does not have any impact so far as the income tax depreciation are concerned and of course uh, this will change uh, provisions relating to MAT etc where uh, there is a direct impact on the taxation. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to the uh, next slide in terms of depreciation there is a choice of method of depreciation available this is uh, this is time period of number of production units. So number of production units was not available is not available presently but uh, bill says that yes uh, there is an option available and there are transitional provisions uh, in terms of the life if uh, as per the company's bill the life has already been exhausted then uh, th th there are transitional provisions to adjust the balance in the opening retained earnings instead of uh, uh, impacting the profit and loss statement. The, there are rules relating to multiple shifts and there is no specific provision for items up to rupees 5000. Uh, in, in the present scenario, the items up to 5,000 rupees are depreciated 100% in certain cases. So I think these were the provisions relating to uh, depreciation, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, I move to a more important section in terms of the corporate governance, which is relating to the board of directors. Uh, their compositions, the, the independent directors, the audit committees, their remuneration, etc. So I, I think this this part is uh, comparatively important, I would say. And I'll briefly touch upon some of those provisions which are impacting the corporates. Uh, if you look at the composition of board of directors as per the company's bill, the the limit on the number of directors is being increased from 12 to 15. And besides that, if if you look at the company's act, the public companies and their private subsidies they require central government approval if you want to increase the directors beyond 12. Uh, but uh, uh, while this, this limit has been increased to 15 as per the bill and besides 15 in case you want to increase beyond 15 also uh, this only requires a special resolution for every company and uh, only the stakeholders can decide how many directors do you require. And the significant change uh, which is uh, happening is uh, that you, you require at least one woman director for certain classes of companies which are to be prescribed uh, in the boardroom. And there is uh, at least one director who stayed in India for 
uh, for around 182 days in the previous calendar year for every company. And this provision uh, has an objective because there are a lot of expatriates uh, who are sitting outside India and they're running the companies in India and which may not be a very effective management of any company. And uh, uh, therefore this provision says that at least one of the directors at least should stay in India for, for half of the year uh, to run an organization effectively. There is a transitional uh, period which has been uh, uh, provided for compliance with these provisions uh, that within one year from the commencement of the act any company can uh, comply with these provisions. Very significant changes in terms of the independent directors uh, while if you look at clause 49 uh, of, the, of, the list, of the listing agreements etc. Uh, the, the provisions sound very similar but there are still there are differences. Uh, in the independent directors there is a minimum number of one third independent directors which are required for listed companies and for other public companies central government may still prescribe uh, to have independent directors in the similar fashion. And there are very specific provisions and detailed criteria which has been identified. The appointment for independent directors can happen for five consecutive years and for another five consecutive years by a special resolution. And this uh, there is a cool-off period of three years. Uh, this period will be counted prospectively and not retrospectively. So and now onwards when the companies will get passed, uh, you have a, any independent director can be associated with the company for 10 years with a cool-off period of three years. Uh, the retirement by rotation is not applicable to these directors, so they have to be uh, they have to be removed so far as uh, uh, rotation principles are concerned. Uh, a very uh, very uh, sensible provision which says that the liability of the independent directors is limited only for those acts uh, which are with the knowledge and attributes which are attributable to the board process, etc. So they may not be responsible for everything in the in the daily routine life unless they are really aware of through the board process and they are uh, they're informed about that. The, the independent directors would not be entitled to any remuneration or stock options except for fee or compensation uh, in that manner. So, so I think only it's, it's only the stock options which are being denied to the independent directors, but they, they can have the, uh, the fee or the profit, uh, remuneration from the profits based on the percentage etc. Moving on to the next slide, uh, in, in terms of the composition, the maximum number of directorships for any director is being increased from 15 to 20. So presently if you look at the, a, a person can be a director into 15 companies, he can be a director in all the 15 companies which can be public companies. But uh, if you look at the restriction, while the number has been increased to 20, there is a sublimit of 10 for public companies and, uh, and their holding and subsidy uh, companies against 15 presently. So, so there is a structural change uh, in this and uh, besides that even the members may by special resolution can restrict the number of directorships of uh, any person uh, which is more of an uh, onerous responsibility uh, so far as the companies are concerned uh, members may decide anything else. I, I don't know how effectively this provision will be utilized. Looking at the managerial remuneration, uh, the classes of companies which uh, may be prescribed to have the following full time or key manager personnel which includes the CFO. So while the MD or uh, the whole time directors were the key managerial person uh, earlier, company secretaries has uh, already been an official of the company. CFO uh, has not been but CFO is being included for that purpose. So he will be a uh, key manager person and the responsibilities are uh, assigned to CFO as a key manager person. There is no change in the overall individual limits in the remuneration, so all those limits of 5%, 10%, etc., or the 11% total of the profits, they continue to be there. Uh, as I as I've already talked about, that the independent directors are not entitled to remuneration or stock options except for fee or profit related commission. Uh, there is a bit of controversy in this particular clause, which I can see that if there is a profit related commission, uh, uh, how different it may be from the stock options or those kind of remuneration, but. But I'm sure that there would be some clarifications in this regard. Something very important in terms of the audit committee. Uh, every listed or other company as may be prescribed uh, will constitute an audit committee and uh, it will require minimum three directors. And by virtue of uh, the principles of clause 49, there are already uh, similar principles. There may be little uh, varying factors in each of these items. For example, clause 49 talks a little differently. Companies Act presently has uh, something different in section 292. Um, I, I'm sure that every uh, every provision will come at the same platform at some point in time. 
and uh, there is a transitional provision that every audit committee will be reconstituted uh, within these provisions within one year to comply with. Uh, vision mechanism, if you look at uh, the listed companies, they have a recommendatory provision as per listing agreement that they need to have a, a vision mechanism. But, uh, but so far as companies bill is concerned, this is being made mandatory for every listed company or other companies which may be prescribed. Uh, even the board, board meeting can happen through video conferencing which has been applied uh, by the by the listing agreement. So I don't think it's a new provision, but but uh, it's being uh, you know, incorporated in the company's bill. Moving on to the next uh, uh, provision, the loans to directors is restricted only to the managing or full-time directors, uh, which will be at the normal terms. And it can be given to the managing or full-time directors as a part of the conditions of services extended to all the employees and not specifically to those guys or it may be pursuant to a scheme approved by the members by a special resolution. So the, the loans to any other director who is not a managing or full-time director is not, a, is not permissible and uh, these have to be at the normal terms uh, which are applicable to all the employees of the company. Moving on to the next slide, uh, the loans and investment by companies, uh, if you can recall the, the present act uh, has section 372A. Uh, which has uh, provisions relating to loans and investments to be made by the company. Uh, the scope has been extended if you look at C72A, it is not applicable for the loans or investments into uh, by, by a holding company to its uh, wholly owned subsidiary company. Uh, whereas uh, this provision covers uh, even, the, even the transactions between the holding and wholly owned subsidiary company. So th there, is a, there is an enlarged coverage. Interest rate as per the bill are being aligned to government securities according to the uh, tenure, uh, which is a bank rate as per 372 uh, as, as of now. Now, very interestingly, uh, this provision put restrictions on making investment through uh, more than two layers of investment companies. I'm not sure how it will work in, in respect of the present structures, but uh, but there are restrictions and uh, it is being uh, put to, to curb a uh, chain of subsidiaries where the ownership structure may not be very clearly visible and uh, therefore they may be and, and this this may have this restriction may not apply in case you have to comply with the uh, with some of the foreign laws or the Indian laws. Uh, so uh, otherwise, you can't have multiple layers of uh, investment companies other than what has been described. Moving on to the definition of related parties, uh, to my mind, uh, there is a uh, there is a good move to combine a uh, lot of related parties at one place. And if you can recall section 297 of the Companies Act, uh, 371B has certain uh, provisions. Uh, accounting standard 18 talks about the related parties. But if you look at uh, look at this list, there are uh, most of those items are coming together at one place. Uh, there may be some different definitions of related party vis-a-vis -vis, um, accounting standard 18, but I'm sure that there would be some kind of centralization at some point in time. Uh, there are some of those things where it says that uh, the, the relatives with reference to an individual uh, would be members of HUF or spouse or others as may be prescribed. If you look at the company that presently, there are five generations which have been prescribed into the third item and uh, which may again be prescribed, I'm not sure. But, but to my mind, the related parties, the, the provision has, been, has combined and consolidated all of them. Uh, largely at one place may not be everything but uh, with some varying definitions of related parties with the accounting standard 18. If you look at the transactions also, uh, if you look at section 297 of the Companies Act, it does not cover transactions relating to buying property of any kind or selling property and uh, leasing of the properties. But uh, related party transactions uh, under clause 188 of the Companies Bill, there is, a, there is an extended coverage to cover all those uh, transactions. Uh, there has to be a special resolution. So uh, I'll talk in the, uh, in the in the next slide. I'm talking about if there are transactions in the ordinary course of business and on an arm's length uh, basis. Uh, they can be approved. They can be they can be entered into even without members approved. But uh, in any other case, uh, you require a special resolution for companies with paid up capital or some uh, or the transactions beyond a particular threshold, which I'm sure will be prescribed. Uh, they have to go to the uh, shareholders for approvals. And uh, board's report has to contain the justification for entering into such transactions. And I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure actually how this would objectively work. Uh, how will the companies uh, say that such transactions are not at an arm's length? 
and they are not in the ordinary course of business to disclose it in the board's report and provide justification. So I'm not sure how will it work and I'm sure there would be uh, a couple of guidance items which will uh, flow from uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. And there are, there are significant provisions in terms of uh, non-compliance that uh, there, there has to be an indemnification by the concerned director against if there is any loss in terms of these transactions and uh, company may even proceed against the director for recovery of loss. There, there are imprisonments and, uh, uh, and uh, additional fines on this. Moving on to another item which has significant penal provisions. Uh, there is a prohibition on forward dealing in shares or debentures of the companies by directors or uh, key manager personnel. Uh, there is an existing provision uh, within SEBI uh, to curb all these uh, or all these forward trading or buying etc or insider trading of securities but here it is uh, coming into the company's bill uh, talking about the insider trading if there is an access to non-public price sensitive information and the, uh, the pain penalties go up to five years of imp imprisonment or uh, even 25 crores or three times of the amount of profits made uh, uh, under these insider trading so I, I think a very significant provision in terms of the penal uh, actions by the, uh, by the regulatory so these were a certain provisions, ladies and gentlemen, uh, relating to the corporate governance, the board structure, the, the audit committees, the independent directors, their appointment, their tenure, uh, remuneration, etc. And some of those items relating to insider trading, and I think that was more important from the point of view of uh, the, the objective by which uh, entire company's bill or the company's act is being uh, rehashed. So uh, coming to the third section uh, on, on certain specific provisions which I'll run through and uh, they're not they're they not very lengthy so if you look at the government companies there are no significant changes in the basic provisions and uh, so far as the uh, non-government companies are concerned uh, we, we've talked about the provisions relating to uh, rotation of auditors etc which are not applicable to government companies so the so in respect of the government companies uh, unlike five years for other companies the auditors uh, would continue uh, to hold office till conclusion of the AGM and they, they are eligible for reappointment uh, there are extended powers which have been given to C and AG, uh, including directors, directions for conducting the audit uh, and certain provisions relating to when the auditors resign from the government company uh, and to file statements, provide reasons, etc. Uh, something very interesting which is happening in terms of compromises, arrangements, and amalgamations. Uh, there are provisions. Uh, there are simplifications. I would say. So companies will talk about the mergers without court approval in specified cases. Now, presently, as per the Companies Act under Section 391 to 395, the provisions talk about uh, going to the going to the court, uh, you know, merging under schemes, uh, doing uh, structuring under schemes, etc. But uh, but the bill prescribes that if there is a merger of two or more small companies, you don't need to the court. You don't, you don't need to go to the court. And the holding company and its wholly owned subsidy can be merged without without a scheme of uh, without uh, approval of the court. And there may be such other classes of companies which may be prescribed for uh, for the similar principles. Uh, there is a possibility of merger with a foreign company. Uh, the bill permits merger into foreign uh, foreign company and vice versa, subject to prior approval of RBI. Uh, I'm sure central government will make certain rules. Uh, RBI will be consulted on this and they'll notify the relevant jurisdictions uh, as well. But but I'm I'm sure that the uh, corporates will have a uh, lot of opportunities to merge companies outside and uh, uh, you know uh, vice versa. This provision uh, ensures that there are no there are not unnecessary objections to the scheme by uh, by stakeholders. So there there is a threshold that 10 percent or more of shareholding or 5 percent or more of outstanding debt, uh, then you can create an objection to the schemes. Uh, this is a very positive step just to avoid frivolous litigations. Similarly, auditors have to certify the accounting treatment in conformity with the accounting standards. Uh, presently, it is applicable to all the listed companies. Uh, so far as the bill is concerned, it will be applicable to listed as well as unlisted organizations. Uh, even in case of corporate debt restructuring, there is a threshold being defined that uh, consent of at least 75% in value of secured product creditors to, uh, would be required. Currently, the consent of 75% in value of creditors which are present and voting that is required. So, uh, so that there is a structural change uh, in terms of approval of these schemes. Uh, 
this would require a valuation report in respect of all the assets of the company by a registered valuer. I'll talk about the concept of registered valuer, uh, which is a new concept. And uh, wherever there is a valuation required under the provisions of the Act, it shall be by a registered valuer. Uh, these are to be appointed by the audit committee and the board of directors of the company. Uh, there would be rules uh, which will be prescribed for the valuation norms. Uh, there are a lot of independence related provisions for the valuers and if there are contraventions, there are penal provisions. Uh, there, there may be different circumstances which may require valuation by a registered valuer and which may include, for example, preferential allotments. A uh, lot of related party transactions which happen in which may require uh, valuations. In case of amalgamations, of course, in case of liquidation. So those kind of principles, uh, the agency like registered valuer, uh, they, they will play a very important role. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, all in the presentation and uh, I would just recap a couple of uh, important provisions uh, in the presentation. Uh, we talked about the independent directors' the roles and responsibilities and their terms, the reforms relating to related party transactions because the stakeholders have to, or shareholders have to take decisions instead of the uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs or the government and uh, you know, uh, creating interventions into that. Uh, assurance as to internal financial controls we spoke about. Uh, there are enhanced role of auditors and uh, greater emphasis on independence in terms of non-audit services, etc. Uh, rotation of auditors is a new concept. Uh, multiple layers of subsidies we spoke about and uh, we also talked about that this may require a significant amount of guidance from the ministry uh, in terms of the existing structures. Now we spoke about the board's report which will include manner of evaluation of performance and several other items and there are significant uh, onerous responsibilities in the board's report. Uh, corporate social responsibility we spoke in detail uh, in terms of the cash outflows, in terms of the applicability and the parameters and what kind of uh, uh, things an, a board of directors uh, have to do uh, to fulfill the responsibility relating to corporate social responsibility. There are simplified procedures in, uh, in terms of multi mergers and uh, even the cross-border mergers we spoke about with the RBI permissions etc. but they, they are available as options. There are significant amount of penalties we spoke about in terms of insider trading, in terms, in terms of fraud etc. Uh, powers of NFR and National Financial Reporting Authority we spoke where we said uh, that the powers of the Institute of Chartered Accountants are being shifted to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and NFRA would have uh, significant um, uh, responsibilities and powers to oversee the the professionals. Uh, one thing which we did not include in the presentation was that uh, the SFIO is being given a statutory status within the company's bill while it's a part of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs as of now, but it will have significant powers within the company's bill. The, the, the reopening of financial statements by the court or tribunal or board of directors we spoke and it's a new concept. Uh, this is not in terms of uh, what the accounting standards talk about, but, but very interesting concept. Uh, in terms of the international financial reporting, uh, the, the consolidated financial statements are, are being uh, uh, you know, proposed in the company's bill. There are extended definitions of subsidy, etc. Uh, depreciation, there are structural changes we, we spoke about. We, we talked about the uniform financial year. The concept of registered value we, we recently talked about. Uh, the multiple forms of companies, uh, of course, we did not speak about, but there are, uh, the company's bill talks about the one person company uh, private companies which can be small in other companies. There are dormant companies which might have, they, they have not done business for the last two years. Uh, public companies which are listed in other organizations. Uh, recognition of limited liability partnerships. So there are significant number of uh, structures which are being advised by the company's bill uh, to frame according to the size and the, and the capacity of the entrepreneurs. So I think this was all I had. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, I would request the organizers to to open the floor for uh, questions, and uh, we'll try to answer your questions. If you, if I'm not in a position to answer your question, I'll I'll take it down, and uh, we'll try and uh, uh, revert to you in short period of time.